how do you get a large language model to cite its answers? Well, you can give it access to your documents and prompt the LLM to always respond with citations. But how do you know it's not just making up those citations? Well, that's the topic of this video. I'll explain how to prompt an LLM so that it responds with citations to any answers. And further, I'll show you how to check that those citations are contained within the documents you provided. I'll give you a high level overview of how this works, and then I'll go through some code step by step so you can implement this by yourself. And here we go for the video overview. I'm going to start by showing just using ChatGPT some of the problems if you do basic retrieval methods and why this can result in answers that aren't always grounded in the content you've provided, the documents you've provided. Then I'll talk about some of the little um, nuances involved in checking that the citations are valid. I'll then move to doing some code demonstration, start to finish of how you do retrieval on uh, some documents and then verify those citations. And last of all, I'm going to show you uh, even how this can be integrated within an app. Uh, there's an app called Trellis Endpoints that's in alpha. You can check it out right now at endpoints.trellis.com. It's a one-click RAG endpoint for documents you upload. And here uh, we've implemented, I've implemented with the help of Rohan Sharma, uh, this citation checking technique. So to start off, let's head over to ChatGPT and uh, start off a new chat. And I'm going to consider asking a question that should be grounded in a document. Now to do that, let's just go over to Wikipedia and pick out some random uh, article that we'll use as a basis for the answers. So I'll just pick one here. Yeah, nice. Let's do one on Gaelic football. Um, this is Irish football, which uh, the final was played over the weekend. And um, let's just copy everything. So I'm doing a raw copy. And this is maybe representative sometimes of when you strip text from documents. It's not parsed necessarily in a, in a very uh, tidy format. And I'm going to copy that into ChatGPT. And I'm going to just read this here and pick out a question. Um, yeah, I'll just ask how many players there are per team. So that'll be my question. So let's just put in uh, some background here. And rather than providing snippets, I'm just going to provide the whole context. And now I'm going to ask a question and I'll say, please help me with my questions. Your answers should contain verbatim citations from the background information. Okay. And then the question is, how many players on a team in Gaelic football? So here I've provided a lot of background and we should have the answer coming out. And so here we have the answer, and this is correct. And it probably knows this already because there's a lot about Gaelic football online. Uh, by the way, it's a bit between American football and Aussie rules, uh, something like that. So we have this citation, Gaelic football. It is played between two teams of 15 players on a rectangular grassed pitch. So let me just copy this piece of text and um, paste. And it looks like that is actually matching exactly. So that's good. And how about this here? If I copy this full citation, um, it is not. So what's happened is we've got an answer. It's the correct answer. It's actually fairly nicely cited. Uh, part of the citation is exactly represented within the underlying text. But actually, if you take the whole citation, it's not actually a correct citation. It's not appearing verbatim within the text. Um, and this is kind of classic with language models. They will often be close. But even worse, they can sometimes just hallucinate what the citation is. And this obviously poses a problem because you've provided the background information. You hope that helps. You hope it will be grounded. You prompt the LLM to be grounded in that answer. And yet you will find cases where the LLM is just hallucinating. And that is something that you do not want. So how is it we can uh, check that these citations are correct? And the answer is, well, one thing we can do is compare, like I did with Control F, whether that little snippet that's cited is provided uh, within the original text. And you saw I did that um, by doing a complete match and it failed. Um, and then I did a partial match and it succeeded. But really what we would like is to get the language model to respond in a way that is providing exact snippets. So we really need to prompt it towards exact snippets. 
and we want to cross-check those exact snippets in the text, allowing for only small amounts of fuzziness. So for example, if I have a word like um, the man jumped over the chair, for example, if this is the citation, um, in the text, it's possible, like maybe there's an extra space, for example, uh, that's accidentally there during the parsing of the document. Maybe there's a space before the dot at the start. Uh, maybe there's a capitalization difference. So these little differences are not concerning when we're th thinking about matching. And we need to allow for those uh, by doing what's called fuzzy matching. But we don't really want to allow for a match uh, if it says something like the man and the woman. Um, because that's going to be too different and there's too much risk that that citation is not really represented within the underlying text. Now, the last thing I'll say, and I'll show this all in code, is sometimes uh, even when you prompt the language model to respond this way, it's not going to get it right. It's not going to provide a citation. So it's just going to fail uh, your test. So you do some fuzzy matching and it fails. But what you can do then is feed that information back to the language model explaining why it failed and give it another shot at generating a better response that is cited. And so by using this kind of iteration, you don't want to iterate forever, but if you iterate maybe once or twice, you have a good chance that the next uh, citation is going to be correct. So let's just try a very quick iteration, and I'm going to add an extra feature which will help me parse the answer, because to do the comparison, we need some Python code, so we like that the answer is being provided uh, in a nice format. So let's um, say try that again with a few more uh, tips. So I'll say one, make sure the citation is exactly verbatim uh, from the background information. And two, provide your answer in JSON form. So I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna give an example. So let's say we want, um, can't do tab, so I'm just going to put it in as a JSON object with answer. And then we would have the answer here. And next, we would have citation, the verbatim citation. And I think that's already a good start. So let's see if we get that. So the idea here is we've now got a structured response, which makes it easier for us to parse and start now to do an exact comparison. Um, and we also have this kind of nicely structured so that we can either optionally include the citation in responding to the customer, um, yeah, or just provide the answer on its own. So let's see if that helps. Uh, we've got this here, Gaelic football. And when I search, it's um, actually not matching exactly. And what I'm gonna say is that doesn't match exactly background text. And let's see if it gets it right. And now it does. So you see there, even by saying that this doesn't match, you have a good chance that it's going to correct. And I'm not saying this is going to work every time. So what do you do then if it doesn't find the correct citation? Uh, well, quite simply, you can just let the user know that this answer does not have a verified citation. So although that's uh, not ideal, because of course you'd like to provide the answer, it's of course much better when you provide an answer if you give the warning that, look, this isn't uh, being cited. So with that, I'm going to move and go through a detailed code example. I'm going to work through um, a code example in the advanced inference repo. This is available if you head just to trellis.com and you go to advanced, let's see, advanced inference. I'll update this shortly so it includes some notes on the citations portion. This is a lifetime access repo. If you buy lifetime access, you get access to all the future scripts as well. It includes many scripts for API calling, speed testing, um, sensitive data anonymization, Monte Carlo simulations, and it will also have now added in the citations portion. So we'll be working out of this new citations port, uh, folder here, which I have copied or rather git cloned onto my VS code. So you can see here, I'm working within uh, this citations folder here. And we'll take a look at the readme just for doing the setup. So here in the readme file, uh, first thing I recommend doing, and I'll actually do all the steps here today, is setting up a virtual environment. 
I'm going to call it site env and then activate that environment. If you're on Windows, just check with ChatGPT, the fastest way to go with that. Uh, so you can see here I've activated site env. Next, um, pip install upgrade pip. It's typically a good idea to make sure pip is at the latest version. And then install this range of packages here um, that are going to help us to do some of the comparisons and also generate uh, embeddings, which will help us to retrieve chunks. So in the example I showed you with ChatGPT, I literally put the whole Wikipedia article as the context. Um, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to work with chunks instead. So I will provide the most relevant chunks using cosine similarity and also using BM25. BM20 is a glorified keyword search. It actually performs really well, often better than cosine search. So when you combine it with cosine search and you take those chunks, you get pretty beautiful results. If you want to go more in detail on that, check out um, the RAG video that I made recently. I'll throw up the video uh, so you can have a look in much greater detail at optimizing retrieval. So I've installed those packages and now just make sure you have a .env file that has uh, your OpenAI API key within it, because we're going to use OpenAI uh, GPT-40 for answering the questions and also for generating embeddings. So next, you need to have some document. So I picked a random Wikipedia article, and again, I'm going to use another random Wikipedia article um, for this example. This time, it's talking about the great cuckoo dove, and uh, yeah, it's just about this random bird and some information that has been uh, populated here just by copy paste from Wikipedia. So yeah, put together a text file just within the data folder here. Once that's ready, um, check out in your prepare.py file. If you go down to main, just make sure that the input file is the text file that you've set up. And the same if you go to app.py, make sure that um, you also have specified the correct input file. Sorry, it's specified up here a little bit more. Yeah, here we go. It's actually specifying uh, the input file, which is the chunks file I haven't created yet, and the embeddings file. So what happens here, it's a two-step process. First step is running prepare.py, python prepare.py. And this should generate chunks. So it takes that Wikipedia text, and it will split it up into 500 word chunks, and it will then create an embedding, so a vector representation for each of those chunks using the OpenAI embeddings endpoint. So while that's happening here, let's take a quick look at the prepare script. Again, this is not the main focus of this video. I talk much more in the RAG video about this. Um, but very quickly, I've got one function that junks the text. Um, it does so using word tokenize from the NLTK library. You could use better methods than I do in the other RAG video, but broadly speaking, I count all the tokens and split into 500 token chunks. Next, uh, I have a function to fetch embeddings. That means for each chunk, converting it into a vector that represents its meaning. And it's called fetch embeddings parallel because I use multiple threads uh, on my computer to fetch for multiple chunks at once, just speeds up the process. Now, once those embeddings are fetched, so we have a vector for each of the chunks, they're going to be written to um, a pickled file. And that pickle file will be saved in data. So we'll have one file for chunks and we'll have one file as well uh, for the embeddings themselves, which is the vectors. Now it looks like I need to pip install env, which is to read in my environment variables. So I'm going to make a quick update to the readme file. I need to add in the installation of, and you know what? This is a classic mistake. So I'm not going to leave this out of my recording. Um, pip uninstall.n. I need to actually python, sorry, pip install python.env. Classic mistake. Classic mistake. So I fixed that now, and we should be able to run and generate the chunks using the prepare.py script. So yeah, as you can see here, it's, it's quite a short script. The prepare data file is going to read in the input file define the name for the chunks file, define the name for the embeddings file, and it's going to create chunks by chunking the text it read from the input file, and then create embeddings using the fetch embeddings parallel function by inputting the chunks and inputting the OpenAI client. And uh, yeah, when all of that is done, we will end up with a pickle file and an embeddings file. You can't view those because they're in pickle format.
And yeah, that's pretty much it. So this uh, prepare.py just calls the prepare data function and then it will generate uh, the embeddings and generate the chunks. So next we're going to run the app and the app is going to do a few things. So it's going to prepare a prompt which will have uh, a query. It will have the chunks relevant to the query and then it is going to have some language that will encourage it to provide citations in a JSON form. And then it's going to have a checker that will check how those cite check whether those citations are in the raw documents. So let's head over to app.py. And this is a little bit of a longer script. It's easiest if I start by explaining it uh, from the main function. So let's go to the main function where we read in the pickle file for the chunks. That's just um, a list of the chunks and their contents. And the embeddings file, which is the vectors representing those chunks. Then we're going to load the chunks from the chunk file, load the embeddings from the embedding file, and specify a query. So my query here on this uh, bird database, or this bird Wikipedia entry is, when does the great cuckoo's offspring go off foraging? And why is that? It's a bit of a tongue twister. And then I set top n. So top n is saying, how many of the top most relevant chunks do I want to include? And it's not the total chunks, it's actually the chunks per uh, retrieval method. So it will take the top two chunks from cosine retrieval and the top two from BM25, which I said is a glorified word search. So next we do those two retrieval methods. We have the BM25 method where we retrieve the two most relevant chunks based on glorified key search. And then we retrieve the two most relevant chunks based on comparing the um, distance or the angle rather between the query and each chunk. So we've got a ton of chunks. They're in all different directions. And we find the two that are at the smallest angle to the query, uh, this query here. And by the way, that means we also have to embed the query. So that means we convert the query into a vector. Then we compare that vector with each of the vectors in the chunks in the embeddings database for the chunks. Okay, so once we fetched uh, those chunks, you can see we're passing in top n because we're picking out the top two. Um, we then merge them. So what happens is often, I mean, this is often a good thing. If you have two independent methods of finding relevant chunks, hopefully they'll have some similarity and find uh, similar relevant chunks. And of course, there's no point in including duplicates. So you can just merge the list as I've done here. Now we get to the system prompt part. So the way the system prompting works is we'll have a system message that's telling GPT-40 uh, to uh, answer using citations. And then we're gonna have the user query. So there'll be a system message that gives the instructions and then the user query is just short. It's just the user query that I listed up here. So let's look in detail at the system prompt. You're a research assistant. Use the provided document snippets to answer the query. So yeah, we're trying to get it to ground its answers in the query, in the documents. Format your response with citations in structured JSON format. And yeah, not only am I asking it to respond in JSON, I'm actually telling it to respond in these XML tags. Why is that? It's because it makes it easy for me to take the answer and um, find what's within the XML tags and then grab the JSON, load the JSON from there. And yeah, as I kind of showed earlier, there's going to be a response portion and then there's going to be a citation portion. Now I'm going one step further than what I showed earlier. I want it to provide a snippet for the citation, but I also want it to provide information on the document it's pulling that snippet from. So if now I've only one document here, but if I had multiple, I would want to know from which document. And you could take this further and tell it um, which page um, it's getting the information from, provided your input data has properly tagged with pages, which this data is not. Okay, so then some rules on uh, citation rules. Each citation must be a complete sentence or phrase from the original text. They must be verbatim and exact. Do not use ellipses or any shortening techniques. So one thing that language models will do is when they cite, they'll give this dot, 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 this. Makes perfect sense. That's what we would do uh, as humans when we cite as well. But it makes it harder to do matching. And actually, I have some programming logic later on that will detect, even if it doesn't obey this to avoid ellipses, I will split up any, cite any snippets in citations, um, remove the ellipses, and check the independent pieces. Um, so yeah. You'll see that later. Don't paraphrase or modify the text. If you need multiple uh, sentences, just include them in full. Use multiple citations if needed. Ensure that it directly supports a part of your response. So you don't want random citations that aren't related to the response. Um, if you cannot find relevant information, state this clearly in your response. So yeah, 
if you ask a question that's related to like the toucan and this is the great cuckoo dove, then we just want the language model to respond, uh, look, that's not in these documents. And then as is often a good idea, we provide, and uh, when we say we, I mean I, provide an example of uh, relevant, uh, I provide an example of a correct response. So here's the kind of JSON you want. It's got a response, it's got citations, it's got a title. Presumably there was a document that I provided with this name uh, and then a snippet and same for the second one here. So actually, yeah, you can see here, uh, this is an array of citations. Now I'm going to continue on my prompt formatting and next I'm including the actual chunks. And I do this in a very structured way. I start off by saying, okay, an XML tag that starts documents. Now here's the document title. This is important because remember earlier, I asked that the language model provide the title in uh, the citation. So I provide the document title, which is grabbed from the, uh, from the file, the chunks file. And then I iterate through the top chunks. So there'll be a maximum of four chunks, two times two, could be less if there's similar, like if there's matching chunks in the two retrieval methods. So I'll, I'll put in the chunks and then I'll close off that document XML tag. Um, and yes, I also, you can see I'm closing two XML tags. I'm closing the specific document name XML tag, and then I'm closing off to say, okay, that's the end of the documents. And now I've got a few extra reminders <laughs> here. This is probably overkill. Um, don't modify shorten, ensure it's directly relevant. If you can't find the answer, clearly state it in your response. And now I'm saying now, uh, please answer the given query using the provided information and these following guidelines. So I'll print out the system prompt so you can see it when I run the script. And you'll see here, it's very simple, the messages that I pass in. I pass in that simple prompt, that big long yoke there. And then I pass in the query, which is the short question. Okay, so that's getting the first response. And maybe we get it on the first shot, we get a nice citation. So now we want to check if the citation is correct. And we're going to use the iterating approach so that if the citation is not in the document originally, we're going to do a max of three, uh, three round trips, hoping that the LLM will improve its citation. So we get the first response uh, from GPT-40 Mini. Then we take out the response from that and we load the JSON. So if um, we just get a pure JSON, we load that JSON. And we also just print the attempt number so we know where, where we're going. And next we will print out the citations. So we'll grab the citation, um, the citation key pair from within the JSON object that was loaded and print that out. And if there's an error, well, we'll print the response so I can just look at it and examine down here. So now we've kind of extracted a JSON and we've got, um, we've got the citations from it, presumably, unless we hit an error. So the next step is to check those citations. Now I'll go through the citation check function, the verify citations in a second, but assuming that goes well, if we pass the citation check, it will print uh, check passed. Here's the query, here's the answer, and here are the citations. And we'll just print out the citations. Now, if we fail the citation check, then we're going to add the assistant, we're going to add an assistant message which contains uh, the response text. And this is where we kind of iterate so that the language model realizes that it's not citing properly. And we'll help it by saying the following citations don't match the provided text. Uh, so please, please correct your response. Um, so that's the next user message we put in. And that brings us back to the start of the loop. And we'll do that loop a maximum of three times where we again get it to answer the question, hopefully this time with citations that are contained within, we run a check. If it passes the check, we're done. If it's not done, we'll do one last uh, attempt at getting the language model to cite it properly. Now, if it fails all of the three uh, checks, we'll say warning, this response is either lacking citation or the citations could not be verified in the background materials. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, this is the best we can do, but it's still useful. It's definitely a lot better to know that the citation's wrong than to just have an answer that is 90% of the time correct. Now, the last thing I want to show is that verify citations function. So let's control F and read through this. So it takes in two things. It will take in the response dictionary, which contains the citations the language model provided. And it will also take in the top chunks because at the end of the day, we're trying to compare what the language model thinks are the citations with the actual content it was fed. 
So first thing we do is grab the citations from the response dictionary. If there are any, if there are no citations, then there's nothing to check. So we got a return saying that we haven't passed the verification test. And next, we're going to normalize the chunks. So this is where I was talking about uh, small differences between the language model citation and the original text. If it's like a space or a full stop, that's not a problem. So we don't want to be that sensitive. And that's why the normalized text helps. So we can take a quick look at normalized text. And it just does some substitutions around lowercase punctuation and normalizing the white space. Uh, so yeah, we will normalize both the query and we'll also normalize uh, the chunks. So this is just normalizing the chunks, but you can see down here, we actually normalize uh, the citations. So we go through each of the citations because there could be multiple. We get the snippet, which is the citation part itself. And if there's no cited text, we again have to return saying there's no verification. But if there is cited text, we normalize that cited text. And we now, uh, for every chunk that was provided as relevant information, we check if the normalized citation is a substring of the normalized chunk. So we're just checking that the LLM citation is contained and its portion of at least uh, one of the chunks. Now we do that on an exact basis. And when I say exact, it's actually a bit looser than exact because we've already normalized. So actually this generally will pass uh, on the exact match. But if it fails that, we'll allow for a bit more fuzziness using uh, the great fuzzy wuzzy library. So we'll use fuzz.partialRatio. ratio. And if the fuzziness is over 90%, then uh, we're gonna let it pass. Uh, I think that's still a fairly high threshold just from empirically testing through it. And you could probably control that if you want to. If there's stuff that's not passing and you think it should, you can lower the threshold here below 90. So then once uh, we do find a match, we append the match. And if everything works well, we'll return the matches. So all matches, this will return true if we have uh, the citations all verified and we'll return the citations as well. Now, what I'm expecting is every, every citation needs to pass the test for it to be considered a success. If every citation does not pass, it's gonna go back around a loop and get the LLM to answer again. So yeah, you can't just get like one or two of them right. The bar is high. You should, and when I say you, I mean the LLM should be getting all of the citations right. So moving uh, back to the main function here. All right, second recap, we load the files, we retrieve the relevant chunks, we prepare the system prompt. We um, make sure that chunks are included in the prompt and we define the messages which contain the system prompt and then a user message with the query. We do all of this checking. We hopefully exit the loop, uh, not through the else loop where it says we don't have a match. We hopefully um, exit the loop uh, via a success. And I showed you the success already. It's, uh, let's see, citation check passed. So hopefully we're, we're gonna exit here. This is where we want the program to break. Uh, so let's try it out, Python app.py, and we'll see how the retrieval works. Okay. So first of all, let's look at what the prompt prompt looks like. And you can see here the system prompt. I've just printed this out. Uh, you can see it's uh, giving a sample of how it should respond, giving some rules. Uh, it's giving another example here. Uh, not another example, because this is the response format, and this is an example of the response format actually filled out with some dummy data. Then we give the relevant documents. You can see there is one chunk, two chunks, three chunks. So that means one was overlapping between BM25 and cosine. And then we close off with XML tags. And then we remind of some things and ask for the answer. So that's the system prompt. And when we iterate through first attempt, we get uh, this answer here. Uh, so they begin foraging after by themselves 35 days after hatching. And we get this citation printed here. And then I just print out, just for illustrative purposes, I print out the normalized chunks. So these are like space punctuation and capitalization normalized. So we've normalized first chunk, second chunk, and third chunk. And yeah, I mean, it passed on the first test here. The query is when do the offspring go off foraging? And the answer here is um, by themselves after 35 days it's necessary to gain sufficient strength and skills. And the citation is then provided here. And you can see the citation contains a name, the name of the document and also the snippet that's being cited. 
And if I just copy this here, um, now I'm not printing the normalized citation, so I won't necessarily be able to match it, but it turns out I am matching it. It's just right there within uh, the third chunk. So what you can see here is you get an answer. The answer is correct. The answer is correctly cited. If you want to give it some criticism, um, you could maybe argue that this second answer here is not being is not being cited. So that's maybe a weakness, and that weakness uh, will persist. You can maybe improve it through prompting or through a stronger model than Mini, like use use the. But I think the key point is because we're pushing on citations, we're forcing the model to do at least one citation, so it's at least going to be somewhat grounded. And then we're checking that citation is valid, so we actually have real information that's like deterministic on whether the citation is uh, valid, or if it's invalid, we can provide a warning based on that. So this is the scripts overview. Uh, that wraps up the scripts overview. And next, I'm going to do uh, an app demo. This is a demo now of how you can integrate uh, something like the citation checker into an app. Here's something I've been working on with Rohan Sharma, who has joined uh, Trellis as uh, an intern. You can check out the internships program over at trellis.com if you're interested. And I've logged into endpoints.trellis.com. Uh, the app is still in alpha. And the idea is you can upload some files. So here, as uh, you might expect, I uploaded the Touch Rugby International Rules. And you can upload multiple files here and then start to query those uh, documents. So for example, I'm going to ask um, how many players on a team uh, for touch rugby, say on the field at one time. And then I can run test. The latency is a little bit low because um, we need to improve how we are setting up the embeddings. So that should be a little bit faster soon. By the way, if you do log in, you will have, I think, a free credit allowing for tens of um, requests. So you should be able to test it out. And here's the result. You've got a team must have a maximum of six players on the field at any time. And it's got this citation, uh, which has been verified. So yeah, the idea is to give uh, a very easy way to upload documents and then get kind of cited results from those. Now here, I can show you um, a possibility of using this as an endpoint. So if you're a developer and you just want to uh, not mess around with setting up and optimizing RAG, you can just upload documents and immediately get uh, an open AI. I'm going to call it an open AI style endpoint. It uh, doesn't have parameters like temperature yet, but um, you can specify, say, messages, um, model, etc. And you do need to put in your authorization token. So you'd have to click view here. But if you just copy paste this and put it into a terminal, you'll be able to get back a response that will provide uh, an object containing the answer and containing the citations. So the idea here is a one-click endpoint uh, for your documents. So I uh, hope that illustrates how you can make use of this uh, citation approach. Uh, this is in alpha, so appreciate any feedback on the tool. And um, let me know any questions in general about this video on citations or other ideas you have to further improve upon the approach. All the best, folks.